you very much. Please be seated. Okay. Over <coughs> yes. In the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil, he is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. We are outside the presence of the jury. Will you approach, counsel? housekeeping matters before we get started. Your Honor, I just have one issue. I think the prosecutor inadvertently referred to this as the tub or there was an impression left that this is the actual tub and so I think the jurors need to be told that this isn't the actual tub. Any objection to that instruction? No, when I refer to it as the tub, I mean... Okay. Is this, is it of the same manufacturer and make or is it similar? Um, we believe it's the same. We believe it's the same, Your Honor. I don't know if the court heard that. I didn't. Uh, Mr. Robinson informed me that um, <clears throat> the manufacturer's name is different because the manufacturer of the tub in the McNeil's home was bought out, but the new manufacturer retained the same model number and the same dimensions. And okay. And I do have another matter of housekeeping. Go ahead. Uh, there's an exhibit I'd like to have marked. Uh, it's the... Uh, Phone records from the Daniels during the time of Casey Price's trial, she said she moved to uh, her husband Doug. And uh, I've spoken to Mr. Spencer, both parties have already submitted and we've stipulated to its admission. Very good. What number is it? 21. Any objection to 21? No objection. 21 is received. You'll be using it with Mr. Daniels? Uh, no, I'm done. Okay. Yeah, it'll be right here. Maybe we're gonna ask him about it to clarify. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. All right. We, uh, Anything else? Okay, let's have them in. Thank you very much. Please be seated. We'll go back on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. Mr. McNeil is present with his attorneys. The state's attorneys are present and the jury is seated. Uh, could, is Mr. Daniels here? If you would retake the witness stand. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in prior uh, testimony today, the tub has been referred to as the tub. 
I wanted to inform you that this is not the actual tub taken out of the McNeil's house, but it is the same model as the tub that was installed in the McNeil's home. You may cross. <clears throat> Mayor, approach your honor. You may. Um, Mr. Daniels, I'm showing you what uh, what we marked on the break as it's actually the state's exhibit number 21. Uh, do you recognize this document? I do, yes. And what is that? Uh, this is a cell phone statement from my wife Christy's phone. Okay. And uh, on April 11th of 2007, uh, oh, well, I guess I should ask that question, sorry. Uh, is, is that a cell phone statement uh, referring to the time period of April of 2007? It is, yes. And on that day, does it uh, show a detailed call log of calls your, your wife made? It does, yes. And is there a call to you uh, at 11.53 a.m.? It is at 11.53 a.m., yes, less than one minute, yep. And, and does that correspond with your memory of when uh, when Christy called you to come to the McNeil home? It does, yes. Okay, thank you. And when she called you, uh, you had a hard time understanding her, didn't you? Um, she was, I could tell she was out of breath and speaking quickly, so instantly I just cut her off and said, where are you? And, and, she, and she said, McNeil's. She said McNeil's, yep. And, and then and you raced over as you described, Correct. right? Okay. And as you um, well, strike that, uh, uh, prior to today, you've had the opportunity to, to discuss uh, the events of April 11th, uh, 2007 with uh, the investigators in this case, right? Yes, I have. And you did that on a couple of occasions? Yes. And then you've also had the opportunity to testify at a preliminary hearing in this matter Correct, as yes. well. And that was a year ago in October? Sounds right, yes. Okay. And you would have given uh, honest and accurate information in those meetings as well, right? I would have tried to do my best to remember, correct. Okay. And in... Um, may I approach your honor? You may. In uh, the uh, December 15th of 2009 interview, do you see that one there? Uh, the yes. The smaller one. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you turn to um, uh, page uh, or, or line 65. Yeah. And towards the bottom, uh, Mr. Whitney was asking you what you observed when, when you first went into the bathroom. And, and you told him that you saw Mr. McNeil on one knee or bent over, it appeared, you know, in her head area and trying to push on her chest. Is that correct? Yes, trying to do something to her chest, I'm not sure. Uh, appeared that, that he was making an effort to, to push on her chest in a CPR type of fashion. Fair statement? Could have been, yes. And then if, if you turn back uh, to uh, line 175, forward to 175, I should say. When Mr. Whitney asked you about uh, the, the mucus, you told him uh, that, uh, that Mr. McNeil did grab a towel 
or something that was there and wiped it off and then continued. Is that correct? Um, as I, you know, it says something in there, like I stated earlier today, I recall something about him trying to wipe it or I don't know if he used his sleeve or if something was there or her hand, but there was, I recall some minor or some small effort to do something with the mucus. Exactly what that was, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. That's why it, my statement here, I think, says something, a towel or something, or I, I'm just not sure what it was or what happened. At least your memory on December 15th of 2009 was that he grabbed a towel or something and, and wiped off mucus. Is that right? Yeah, something emphasized just as much as towel. Okay. Yeah. Right. And the, uh, the mucus that you observed was, was mostly clear, correct? Could have been not a lot of coloration in it. There was mostly clear, sure. Yeah. There was some color. It wasn't straight clear, but... Perhaps yeah. mostly clear, I think, yes, I would recall. You, would you turn to your preliminary hearing testimony? That's the, the big, thick one. This one? Yeah. And turn to page 386. <clears throat> and then down at uh, lines 21 and 22. At the preliminary hearing in discussing the mucus, you indicated that, quote, it was mostly just clear. It was maybe a, maybe a little bit off and off color, but mostly clear. Is that correct? Um, hold on a second. I'm trying to read and put it in context, see what okay. else I was said, if that's okay. Is that all right? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you know, I stated mostly clear and went on to say maybe a mucousy greenish, uh, maybe a light green color. Yeah. So I didn't just say mostly clear. I, I'm not sure what your question is. What, whether I made that statement on that line, yes, those are my words on that line. Right, that's and, and that's cons is, is it fair to say that that's consistent with your memory, that the mucus was mostly clear? Yes, more clear than it was green. There was more yeah. clear part of the mucus. It seemed like it was... It wasn't all one solid color, if that helps. There was a lot of clear mucus in, and then there were green portions to it, or, or off-colored. So, yeah. And, and as you were there performing CPR, you didn't see more mucus being generated, did you? It, uh, not that I recall. I recall it being, I, I noticed it more. For sure. I don't know if I just noticed it more when I got closer to her and started doing the chest compressions or if it became, you know, more was coming out of her at that point. I, I couldn't speak to that. I don't know. And then up in line 16 in relation to the amount, I'm sorry, still on page 386. Yep. In relation to the amount, you said amount, not a lot. Is that accurate? Yeah, and then I went on to say her face was coated with it, so not a lot compared to, I mean, there was, it was definitely mucus there. There was enough that I would, have, I would not have been able to give her CPR without wiping it off myself. I remember specifically thinking that would be difficult for me to do unless I wiped all that mucus out of the way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, not a lot compared to a bucket, but her face was coated with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the investigators, they, they also asked you about whether Martin was able to give her a CPR with the mucus. Do you remember that? Uh, they asked a lot of questions. Specifically, what are you referring to? All right, would you turn back to the September, not back to this, is the new one, the big one, the September 15th, 2008 interview? Yeah. And then turn to line 620. Uh, 
down towards the bottom of the page. And, mm -hmm. and, and this is actually the, the first interview that, that you uh, gave in this case, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. In 08, yes. And in that interview, uh, the investigator, Mr. Whitney, asked you, was he, re referring to Mr. McNeil, was he putting his mouth over her mouth directly, holding the nose? And you answered, yeah. That's what it appeared to be, yes. And that was based upon what you recalled on that date, correct? Correct. Okay. When you got uh, to the bathroom on April 11th, uh, as I understood your testimony today, uh, you were right behind uh, your wife and, and you understood you needed to go help uh, get Michelle out of the tub, correct? Yes, correct. I don't know exactly how far behind I was, but for some reason I knew, and I don't know if it was because noise was back there or if I had to actually had them in sight when I entered the front door, but I didn't have any struggle finding where to go. Okay. I don't recall why. And uh, if you turn to line 1400 in that uh, September uh, 15, 2008 interview, You mentioned to the investigator uh, that uh, you felt that Michelle was was kind of large to get out of the tub, correct? That's what I said on that line, but if you read subsequent lines, I go on to state that, to go into more detail about it. I don't know if you want to address that or not. But well, I'm happy to address anything. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I stated that, you know, we were talking about her weight or whether she shot, whether, uh, this is Whitney, right? Mm -hmm. What the investigators had thought that I, th that I thought that she had put on weight. Um, I mean, do you want to go read this line by line or should I? What would you like? No, well, I'm, I'm just okay. asking you what, what, what you said. Um, and uh, and my, my question is simply that, uh, that you indicated that, uh, uh, that, that she was kind of large to get out of the tub. That, that's what, what you said, um, right? Then my next line is she was always fairly thin. I mean, she wasn't real petite, but she wasn't real <coughs> overweight. I'm trying to differentiate because Christie's involved in the same interview, so I have to pull out her comments because it was kind of together. And she was, you know, reading in context and thinking about it, she was probably too large for Christie to get out of the tub by herself. I definitely could have got her out of the tub myself. It wouldn't have been an easy task with her with her state and condition, uh, but uh, I'm, are you you just want me to you, acknowledge you, that I said the line she was kind of large to get out of the tub? What, what you I expressed said that line, was that, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, know. yeah, that, that, that's yeah. that's the only question. And and you didn't get her out of the tub by yourself, did you? I didn't need to. Yeah, I definitely could have. If I'd have been the only one there, it would have been very easy. Yeah, um, and how would you have done that? I would have got a hold of her and picked her up out of the tub. Yeah, and you think you, you, you could have Absolutely. just picked her up from the top and, sure. and lifted 180 pounds of Absolutely. Of weight? Okay. You're, uh, how, how old were you on April 7th? Uh, six years younger than now. And how old 40. was that? 40? 40. Yeah. Fairly athletic? I was then. Or was I? Yeah. Okay. Didn't have any injuries to your, to your feet then? And, and you had observed um, Mr. McNeil with, with injuries uh, uh, to his feet, as you testified to, or yeah, to his toe. I observed him dealing with some kind of injury to a foot, yes.
at the uh, preliminary hearing, uh, you also talked about um, Michelle's body temperature as you did today, correct? Could have done. And uh, it's on page uh, 416. On lines 9 through 12, uh, similar to what you indicated today, you said that you, you didn't remember her temperature being hot or being cool, uh, but it felt like body temperature. Correct. And, and that's what you intended to communicate today during your testimony as well, is that? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. After um, uh, the ambulance left, and, and you indicated that Martin left with the ambulance, so you had a, a conversation uh, with uh, uh, the police officer mm -hmm. that day, right? And, uh, and in that um, conversation uh, with the officer, uh, you indicated that... Uh, you did not um, see anything suspicious that day. He asked me if I'd seen anything suspicious, suspicious that day or any events, and I told him no. And then um, you went into the to the house, and as you testified, you you cleaned up, correct? Uh, yeah. Yes. Cleaned up some, I was as best Very as you little. could under yeah. the circumstances. And. Uh, in your interview on uh, September 15th of, of 2008, it's page 952 if, if you want to turn there, uh, you indicated to the investigators that you got all the clothes together, including the bra and whatnot. Is that consistent with your memory today? Um, I remember there being a bra there, um, but, but nothing else. I remember looking around for something to wipe up with, and there was nothing that would have been... A, a dirty clothes pile or anything, but I do remember a bra being there um, somewhere. Now, whether or not whether or not that was in the bedroom on the floor, because there were a couple of different areas that I went around to, whether that was in the bathroom or it, I mean, at this point, it could have been the laundry room. I don't think so. I think it was bedroom or bathroom, but I do remember something about a bra being there. Okay. Do you remember there being a pile of clothes? No, I don't remember a pile of clothes because I remember thinking if, if even if I found a pile of dirty clothes, I would just wipe up the water or mucus that was there with that because it really wasn't a lot of coloration in it, and it I didn't think it would be something that would, would ruin dirty clothes. Okay. Uh, on uh, September uh, 15th, 2008, uh, yep. starting on line 52, uh, Uh, actually, maybe sort of 953. The investigator, uh, Mr. Whitney, asked you, "Okay, so after you got done, you took the towels that you used to clean up. Did you return them to the laundry room?" Line 52. I'm lost. Nine. I'm sorry. 950. Oh, 950. Okay. Starting on line 52. 950. So the investigator Whitney asked you, okay, so after you got done, you took the towels that you used to clean up, did you return them to the laundry room? And you answered, yeah, I think I did. I think I got all those clothes together, including the bra and whatnot, that were laying there on the floor. Is that correct? It's, it could be correct that I think I did. I'm not real sure about that. I, I just remember, what I do remember is looking around trying to find something suitable for wiping, wiping up a little bit of water and mucus, and I just couldn't find anything. That's why I went to the laundry room. The only thing I specifically remember is, is something about a bra being there and not being able to find anything to wipe the stuff up. Okay. And then Mr. Whitney asked you, okay, did you actually pick those up? And you answered, I do believe so. Is that correct? It's, it's correct. There should probably be a question mark at the end of it because I was just as fuzzy on it then as I am now. Okay. And then he asked you, okay, and you took them where? 
And you answered, over to the laundry room and just put them in a pile of dirty laundry that was there. That's, that's what you said, correct? Uh, yeah, I put them back in the pile that I got the, the towels from. Well, you, you, I do recall that. You took the clothes, including the bra, and put them back in the pile where, the, where you got the towels from. I don't from. know if there were clothes. Maybe the bra was the only clothes. I don't know. If you read the next line, he says, do you recall seeing any bottoms? And I, didn't, I did not recall seeing you, any you bottoms or anything else. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, whether it was just the, the couple of towels that I used to clean up and or a bra, I, I don't know for sure. All I do know is that I couldn't really find anything to clean it up with. I, I know I was kind of frustrated with that, and that's when I went looking for a towel. Okay. And, but back in line 52, you said that you got all the clothes together that you took to the, ultimately then took to the laundry room, right? Your Honor, that's been asked and answered. Sustained. Yeah. I don't know how else I can say it. The objection sustained. Okay. And I, just give me one second. I think that's all I've got. One, one more. Back to the preliminary hearing on page uh, 383. Uh, line 14, in relation to to the CPR that uh, first Christie and then Martin and then, then you and Martin were doing, yeah. you indicated that, uh, that Martin appeared to be giving her puffs of air. Is that correct? That's what it appeared to be. That's, I mean, he was over her face doing the face portion of CPR. I was not there. I was doing the chest compression, but that's the impression that I got. From the time that, that uh, you arrived uh, in the bathroom uh, until the police officers are, then arrived and relieved you from CPR, you never left the bathroom, right? Correct. And Mr. McNeil never left the bathroom, right? And, and nobody actually took clothes off of Michelle uh, in the bathroom while you were there? Not while I was there. That's all the questions I have. Do you have redirect? Yes, please, Your Honor. Mr. Daniel, then I have referred to the transcript of your interview on September 2008. Okay. Uh, and we'll just go back to the lines uh, 620 through 627. Okay. Um, just to refresh, Mr. Spencer asked you if you recalled saying in that interview, or responding, yeah, uh, this we're looking at 620 and 621. Mm -hmm. When you, when uh, Investigator Whitney asked you whether Martin was putting his mouth over Michelle's mouth directly and holding the nose. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm gonna direct you now to look at um, lines 622 through 627, subsequent conversation that you had with uh, Investigator Whitney, um, in 623, will you read what, what you said there? Yeah. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, it was a mess, though. And <clears throat> when you're referring to it was a mess, what are you referring to? Just a, just a mucus and, and fluid and something that I didn't want to be part of. Okay. And then in lines 625 through 627, you kind of elaborated on, uh, on what, what you saw Martin doing. Will you go ahead and read that, please? I said, thinking back on it, I was not paying, uh, that was not something I wanted to stare and look at anyway, but thinking back on it, he very easily could have been doing nothing. You know what I mean? That's how much attention I did not pay to that. Um, when you say he could very easily, or he very easily could have been doing nothing, who's the he you're referring to? Martin. 
Um, what were you paying attention to? I was paying attention to doing chest compressions and doing the, my portion like I was supposed to be. I was concentrating on how hard I was pushing on her and waiting for instruction from Martin, but mostly just the chest compressions. I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. And so at that point you had your hands on her chest, is that correct? Correct, except for when he would have me move them off, yes. Okay. Uh, did you see the chest rise? No, I did not. At all? Never. Okay, thank you. Let me clarify that last question if I could. Okay. Um, did you see uh, Michelle's chest rise at all while Martin was giving breaths? No, I did not. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. During the CPR process, you, you never mentioned anything about uh, not seeing the chest rise. We need to make some adjustments, did you? While we were doing it? Yes. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know if you're supposed to see the chest rise. Okay. I mean, I've heard a lot about it since then, but definitely then, I, no, I did not say anything. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Do you want him to remain under his subpoena? Mr. Daniels, you'll remain under your trial subpoena, but uh, if you're needed back, you'll be contacted. Thank you. You may oh, step I'm down. Sorry, um, jury questions? Oh, thank you. Do you have questions for Mr. Daniels? like a couple. Will you approach? Mr. Daniels, just one additional question. When you cleaned up the McNeil's bathroom, what exactly did you clean up? Um, there was a little bit of water and mucus on the, on the floor where she was laying, where we uh, did CPR. Uh, then there was a, maybe just the edge of the tub, there might have been a little bit of mucus or, a, or something just on the edge of the tub. Um, I recall something about that. And then there was a small spot that was on the carpet just inside the, the bedroom, and, and I tried cleaning on that, and I, I remember not being able to get it all. It was a little bit stained into the carpet, and so it really wouldn't come up. Okay. Do you have follow-up questions? If I could, just briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead. Um, maybe if you don't mind stepping down, we could, um, if you look at this uh, tub replica, 
when you say uh, she cleaned up, or you cleaned up, there might have been something on the edge of the tub. Where are you talking about in relation? Um, it, it would have been just on this outside edge. Um, it seemed like there was some mucus or, or just a little bit of maybe the real light, faint blood-colored stain that was somewhere near the edge of the tub that I cleaned up there. Okay, and you're indicating on the, on the, front on the side. long side of the tub closest to, uh, I guess, farther from the window and closer to you. Okay, thank you. Do you have follow-up questions? No. Very good. You may step down. Thank you. You may call your next witness. It calls Ray Ormond. You'll come forward here to the clerk's desk. Please raise your right hand and be sworn. Thank you. If you'll be seated here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Will you please state your name and spell it for us? You bet. My name is Ray Ormond. First name is R A Y. The last name is Ormond, O R M O N D. I apologize. Even though it's been five times, I continue to say Ormond. That's Ormond. all right. Um, how are you employed? I currently work for the Linden Police Department. At the time in question, I work for the Pleasant Grove Police Department. Okay. And so you're a police officer? Yes, sir. And how long have you been a police officer? I've been a police officer in the state of Utah since 2005. And are you post certified? I am. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that I went through and completed the Utah Police Academy. And you're currently certified to be a peace officer in the state of Utah? That's correct. And right now you are assigned in uh, Linden? Correct. In April of 2007, where were you assigned? I worked for the Pleasant Grove Police Department for patrol. Uh, for, as a patrol officer? That's correct. And what shift were you working in April of 2007? Uh, that would have been a day shift. Do you remember the day of April 11th of 2007? I do. Do you remember it perfectly? No. Have you reviewed anything to help refresh your recollection? I have. What, is, what are those materials? Uh, I've reviewed two things. The uh, recorded interview that I had with some Utah County investigators and my previous preliminary testimony. Okay. Do you have an independent memory of, of what happened on this date? Yes. Um, will you tell us what happened on April 11th of 2007? Yes. Um, at approximately or thereabouts 11.48 in the morning, um, a 911 call came into our dispatch center, and we were dispatched on a medical. Um, I don't remember the exact address that we were dispatched to. Um, I remember it was in the Mill Creek subdivision. I was the second officer to arrive on scene. Uh, who was the first officer? It was Officer jo Josh Monsinger. What is his relation to yours uh, professionally? He's also a police officer in the state of Utah. Did you have any relationship professionally in 2007 at that time? Yes, he was my partner. Okay. Um, did you have any confusion getting to the residence? Uh, to my recollection, there were two different 911 phone calls that came in concerning this incident, and it there was some confusion as to the address, but dispatch was able to rectify that confusion and get us an address. And so you were able to arrive where the medical assist had been called from? That's correct. And where was that? Uh, it was in the Mill Creek subdivision at the McNeil home. Okay. What did you do as you arrived there? As I arrived, I exited my vehicle and went to the trunk of my vehicle and grabbed a bag valve mask, or it was called an AMBU bag. It's uh, equipment used to assist in providing, providing CPR. Okay. And then what did you do? And then I ran across the front lawn, over the porch, and into the residence after my partner, Josh Motzinger. So Officer Motzinger was in front of you? That's correct. And then what did you do when you got to the front door? Uh, when I got to the front door, I had lost sight of Officer Motzinger, but I could hear them off to my left found my way through a bedroom and into a bathroom uh, that was adjacent to the bedroom. Okay, and what did you see when you arrived there? 
um, as I was coming into the bedroom, I could see into the bathroom. I could see my partner going into the bathroom. I could see a couple people past him, and then I could tell there was a female on the floor. On the floor of? Oh, the floor of the bathroom, sorry. What kind of a floor was this? Uh, I believe it was a tile floor. And you saw other people there as well? Correct. Did you recognize any of them? Uh, I recognized the defendant, uh, Martin McNeil. Okay. Um, what were people doing in this room when you arrived? Um, my view of what they were doing was partially obscured. I heard Officer Motsinger tell them what we were going to take over CPR, so I assumed that they were doing CPR. Tell me about the uh, female you saw on the ground. She, she was on her ground lying on her back. The upper half of her torso was wet. Um, she had clothing on the upper half of her torso. She had no clothing from the waist down. Um, her hair was wet. What did you and Officer Motzinger do? Um, at that point, because I had the bamboo bag, I began doing rescue breaths. Officer Motzinger began doing compressions. Did you observe anything as you came into the bathroom? Uh, that it was a typical bathroom. There was a tub, a sink. It was a, a narrow area. Um, there was water on the floor. Because uh, I remember thinking to myself, I need to be careful to not slip on the water because it was a tile floor. I approach the witness, Your Honor. You may. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 16. You look at that. Okay. You recognize that? I do. That's the bathroom that we entered. Okay. You said... Um, did you notice anything in the bedroom as you were going through it towards the bathroom? Yes, there were two beds in the bedroom. There was a typical bed, and then there was also a hospital-style bed, um, one that you can adjust the head and the feet. And there was also a nightstand. Did you notice anything about the nightstand? On top of the nightstand, there was a, a pink kidney-shaped container that contained uh, pill bottles. Did you know the female that was on the floor? I did not know her. Um, how did she look? Um, like I previously stated, she was wet, and the, her color was a pale bluish color. She had um, on her face, around her eyes, and in her hairline, she had incisions from a recent surgery that had stitches in those incisions. She also had bruising around her jawline. Um, you, are you trained in CPR? I am. You said there was a, a bluish color about her. Correct. From your training and experience, is that indicative of anything? Uh, that's indicative of two things, lack of respiration, lack of cardiovascular circulation. You said that she had clothing on the upper half of her body. Correct. Do you remember what that clothing was? Uh, to my best recollection, it was a white undershirt. She had a bra and then a uh, black garment over the top. When you say garment, you're speaking generally, not generally. about uh, LDS clothing. Correct. Yeah, just uh, generally just a black garment. What was the clothing like in terms of moisture? It was wet. It was drenched. Did you notice... Uh, Strike that. So you said that you and Officer Motzinger started CPR. Correct. And you had an ambu bag and you started doing, doing rescue doing breaths. breaths. Correct. And he started doing chest compressions. How long did that last? I'm not exactly sure on a time length. Um, it wasn't very long because we realized again um, it's a, a narrow area. There was going to be EMS and paramedics and other people on scene. We decided it would be best and prudent to move her into the bedroom where we would have greater room, greater access for more people to assist. So did you in fact do that? We did. And when you say you moved her into the bedroom, um, what kind of a floor are we talking about? Uh, in the bedroom is a carpeted floor. So we went from the tile floor into the carpeted floor in the bedroom. And when you moved her into the bedroom, did you continue to perform breaths no, at, at that point, we actually switched. Officer Montsinger started doing rescue breaths. I started doing compressions. Okay. You may. Let me show you what's been marked.
Mark is States Exhibit 22. This is a diagram that we've had made up. Council has stipulated to it. Does this look familiar? It does. And what does this appear to be? Uh, it appears to be a diagram of the master bedroom and bathroom of the McNeil home. Okay. Move to admit this exhibit, Your Honor. Any object? 22 is received. I'd like to publish it up here, Your Honor. You may. Pointed out, will you show us on this diagram, and I'll get out of the way, where Michelle's body was when you came in? Originally, she was in this area right here, um, which is indicative of by the water on the floor in that picture. And as you can tell, I mean, it's not a very big area. Master bedroom is considerably larger. There was furniture that we did move to provide us better room, but we removed her from this area into the bedroom to about this area. Um, you moved that furniture in order to bring her into there? It, correct, to give us better access, because like I said, there was going to be other EMS and paramedics on scene. What and specifically did you move? Myself, personally, I moved uh, the nightstand with the medication. That's why I saw the medication on the nightstand. And that's how you remember that? That's correct. Um, where, when you came in, where was the, what you described as the normal bed and where was the hospital bed? In my best recollection, the normal bed was more towards this end of the bedroom and the hospital bed was more over here with the nightstand somewhere in about this area, if I remember right. Did you notice anything as um, you were performing chest compressions on Michelle in the, uh, in the bedroom area on the carpeted floor? There were a couple things that I noted. Um, originally when we started doing compressions in the bathroom, because I had the bag, I could hear a gurgling coming from her lungs. When we moved her into the carpeted area and I took over compressions, the um, when I would do the compressions, I could hear the gurgling from her lungs. I also noted that her color was going from the bluish condition, pale blue, to more of a, a pink fleshy color, and there was starting to be some weeping of blood from the incisions around her hairline and eyes. Okay, you've talked about a few things. One is some bleeding. Correct. Another is changing color. Correct. Another is gurgling. Correct. Uh, from your training and experience, are those indicative of anything? Objection, foundation, Your Honor. Uh, sustained. Um, have you been trained on CPR as it relates to someone who may have been in, exposed to water or in water? Yes. And are there things that you would look for when performing CPR related to that? Correct, yes. Okay, and you've talked about gurgling. Is gurgling one of those things? Yes, it is. Okay, so based on your training, what is gurgling indicative of? I'm going to object, Your Honor. This person has not been designated as an expert, and he doesn't, he can't testify about what that indicates. Can I hear your quote on this?
objection is withdrawn, correct? You may proceed. Um, so what was the gurgling indicative of? Uh, typically it's indicative of fluid in the lungs. Similarly, the change in color and the expression of, of some blood from a wound, what is that indicative of? That I am providing proper rate and depth of circ or compressions, which is manually restoring circulation of blood to the patient. Okay, so you're artificially stimulating her. Correct. Um, has, the, uh, has the training on CPR changed in the last few years as it relates to breasts and chest compressions? It has slightly, but um, not dramatically. As far as rates go, um, it's still around 100 rates a minute. And breaths is still typically two breaths per cycle. Um, but the emphasis has changed more to compressions being proper rate and proper depth. Okay. Um, so you're doing chest compressions. Correct. Does she still have clothing on her upper body at this point? At that point, yes. Was the clothing in between your hand and her body, or were you skin to skin? It was skin to skin. What can you tell us about how her body felt to you? Uh, cold, cool to the touch. And she was wet. Did anything happen while you were performing chest compressions? Yes. Um, as I was doing the compressions and the girl continued, fluid actually came out of Michelle's mouth. Um, at that Describe point, this fluid? Yes, it was clear, um, and there was quite a lot of fluid that came out. How much? If I had to estimate, I'd say about three cups. And what did you do when she began to expel, to expel this clear fluid? We turned her head to the side so that the fluid wouldn't go back into her. Um, at that point, more fluid came out. Um, that fluid was more frothy, um, mucusy, um, not very clear, it was cloudy, and it had a little tint of blood to it. You've talked about two um, expellations of substance. Correct. Where did these, let's talk about the first one first, where did that go? The first one, because Officer Monster was providing rescue breaths, it went on him, went on his hands, went on his legs. Um, when we turned her head to the side, the second expiration of fluid went on me, onto my legs. The frothier? The frothier, mucusy fluid. Okay. Why do you remember the water being expelled? Um, when you're doing compressions, you're kneeling right next to, um, in this case, Michelle. My right knee was right next to her shoulder. And, or sorry, my left knee was right next to her shoulder, and I was leaning over her body, and so I, the fluid was coming out right next to me. Did it get on you at all? It did. Did you? How long was your shift that day? Uh, a day shift runs from six o'clock in the morning till four o'clock p.m. What time? And you said that you were dispatched about eleven forty-eight. Correct. Do you remember what time you called dispatch to check in that you had arrived? Uh, it would have been shortly thereafter. I don't remember the exact time. Probably, yeah, I couldn't give you an exact time. Okay. Um, and you, how long did you stay at the McNeil residence? Uh, I was there until they removed Michelle, and for a minute or two shortly thereafter. So I couldn't give you an exact time length, but that's kind of the... But you still had patrol duty after. I did. I still had several hours of patrol duty afterwards. And so when she expressed this fluid, frothy substance on you, did you continue to wear your uniform that day? No, after that incident, actually during that incident, I was told by a supervisor to go home and change and then come back to patrol shift. And you in fact did that? I did. Um, what happened after you had been doing CPR and she had expressed the liquid and then the second more frothy substance? Uh, I continued doing compressions. The uh, EMTs and paramedics began arriving on scene. Um, at that point, they cut the clothing off of Michelle so that they could put the patches for their EKG monitor on her. Um, once they had done that, they had me cease compressions for a moment, and 
to check and see if there was a, a pulse. And there was not, and so I continued doing compressions. Okay. And then they eventually relieved you? Correct. They eventually relieved me, took over. You've said that um, you recognize the defendant, Martin McNeil. That's correct. Were you observing the defendant during this time when you were doing chest compressions and such? Not during the whole time, but um, as we were doing CPR on Michelle, um, he was moving back and forth in and about the bedroom and the bathroom. Uh, he appeared to be agitated. Um, he would sporadically yell several different things, and it was... My focus was on Michelle, but it would it would break that concentration to see what was going on. What was he yelling? Um, I don't remember his exact verbiage, but he was yelling in references to why she had the surgery, the fact she was on a lot of medication, um, at us to try different things, why weren't the EMTs there faster, that, Was this um, concentrated? Was it all over the place? No, it was kind of more all over the place. Was it like other situations you've experienced? No. Objection, Your Honor. I move to strike that. Uh, sustained. You said it was distracting. Correct. I mean, you've described a few things that are that are being said. So if someone says. Why all the medications? Why did you have the surgery? That's distracting. What was distracting about it? It was distracting because of the volume of which it was yelled at us, or yelled at Michelle. How were you feeling as this was going on? Objection, relevance. Overruled. He may answer to the extent that it changed his conduct. Go ahead. Um, my feelings at that point were more of an officer safety issue. Was it going to go from me doing compressions to me having to maybe restrain him or defend myself? Did the defendant tell you how he had found Michelle? Uh, I overheard him tell Officer Motzinger that he had found her slumped over in the tub. Did he say what had happened? Mm -hmm. To my best recollection that he believes she possibly had passed out and fallen into the tub. How was the defendant dressed on this occasion? He had a white lab coat on that had some type of lettering on the, the chest area and dark colored slacks. I don't remember what type of shirt for sure that he had on underneath the coat. Could you tell if he was wet? Uh, he appeared to be wet on his arms. Were you aware of his profession? Um, I assumed that he was a doctor from the way he was dressed. And if I also remember correctly, we were advised by dispatch that a doctor was on scene. Was he saying anything else? Just from what I've previously stated about why did she have the surgery, why did she take the medication, um, that she didn't need the surgery, and then was telling us what to do, and when the EMTs arrived, trying to tell them what to do. And these were expressions that were loud and... Very loud, very agitated. Okay. And you said you couldn't estimate how long you were there? No. Um... My focus when I was doing compressions was just on trying to maintain that 100 beats per minute. Do you remember if you saw Michelle carried out? I do. You were there then? I was, I was still there when she was placed on the gurney and when she was removed from the home. And how long after that was it that you left? Uh, just shortly after there were um, investigators and supervisors on scene that asked me a few brief questions and then they informed me to go home and change and come back to patrol. Um, as a patrol officer, what was your duty in this situation? On that scene, I was dispatched to assist Officer Motzinger with the call. So my 
main focus and duties were to try to save Michelle's life to perform life-saving efforts. I have just a moment, Your Honor. You may. either the ambu bag or the chest compressions were you did you see Michelle's chest rise um, when I was doing the rescue breaths as I would provide breaths um, I don't honestly 100% recall not I think it it may have but I don't 100% recall don't recall yeah. and this was in the bathroom this was in the bathroom and you moved her out. And we moved her out into the bedroom. And I can't, I, I don't recall from there. To be, Thank you. You bet. You may cross. Thomas Jordan, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Okay, so you moved Michelle from inside the bathroom. Correct. And, and how long were you in the bathroom doing CPR? I couldn't give you an exact estimate of time. Um, it wasn't very long. Okay, but it was a couple of minutes maybe? You know, I, I don't recall. Okay, and then you move her into the master bedroom. Correct. Um, and you testified that uh, her hair was wet. Yes, ma'am. And she was she was wet from from the waist up, correct? Approximately, yes. In fact, um, it's been your testimony in the past that she was sopping wet. Sopping wet, drenched with you, yeah. And, and her hair was sopping wet as well. Correct. Um, let's talk about lividity. You didn't notice any lividity on Michelle. No. Okay, can you tell the jury what lividity is? Lividity is when the heart stops circulating, the blood pools, and the lowest portions of the body, um, the portions that are closer to the ground. Okay. And you didn't notice that? No, I did not. I'm just going to cut out some of my crosshair. Sounds good. Okay, now you talked about... You said that uh, you, well, let me get the exact words here. First, let me ask you, when you said that three to four cups of water came out of Michelle, mm -hmm. you said that water came out at two different times. Correct. One on your uniform right. and one on Motzinger's uniform. Right. Was it a total of three or four cups of water that came out on both of you, or was it three to four cups on you and then three to four cups on him? Um, it was three to four cups on the first initial expulsion of fluid. The second one wasn't quite three to four cups, but it was still a substantial amount of fluid. And uh, you didn't tell um, Doug Whitney when you were interviewed that Michelle had thrown up on you and that you had to go change your clothes? Not to my recollection. You stated that uh, you feared for your safety and that, it, that you thought that you would have to defend yourself Correct. from Mr. McNeil? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and you never mentioned that when you were interviewed by Doug Whitney, did you? I don't remember my exact word as I think I've said it that it made me feel uncomfortable. Okay, but um, did you review your, your statement that you gave to Doug Whitney before testifying today? I listened to it, yes. Okay. And you didn't you didn't hear anything about you saying him being belligerent to the point where you had to defend yourself or you were concerned. Is that correct? Uh, not in those words, no. Okay. And you didn't say anything at the preliminary hearing a year ago either about feeling like you had to defend yourself from Martin. To my recollection, no. Okay. In fact, when you had the interview with Doug Whitney... Um, do you recall telling him 
that the reason that Martin was removed was it was just a matter of getting the family out of there. They said that was one of the reasons that he was removed, yes. Okay. But even when you were followed up with that question as to why he was removed, you didn't tell Doug Whitney, oh, by the way, I, I was concerned enough to the point where I thought I would maybe have to defend myself. Isn't that correct? Correct. So the first time we've heard that is today. Correct. Um, and you didn't know Martin McNeil before this day? No, ma'am. Okay. And so you don't know what his baseline, his normal personality was? No. You don't know if he was kind of a, an over-the-top personality? No. Or pushy or, or animated? No, that was the first time I'd ever seen the defendant, to my okay. recollection. And Martin, you stated said that she must have fallen into the tub, correct? Correct. And then you said that Martin talked about, um, you used the word slumped in the tub. Correct. And, and it was in the tub. <clears throat> correct. Not over the tub. Correct. Now, you remembered seeing the pill bottles. Yes, ma'am. With the, with the medication in the pill bottles. You know, I didn't count the, pill bo the pills that were in the bottles. I do remember that some of them had pills in them, yes. And you never, um, you never saw Martin try to remove the pill bottles? No. When I, the, for the majority of the time that I was in the residence, my efforts were focused on Michelle. Okay. Can I have one more? Do you have redirect? Yeah. Officer Ormond, on, on direct, didn't you use the words slumped over the tub when saying what the defendant told you? It, it's a possibility. I mean, I, I don't remember. Okay. Was it explained in any other way to you by the defendant? No. Um, while you were working on her doing chest compressions, did you roll her over to check for lividity? No. At post, um, were you trained on levels of awareness around you? Correct, yes. Are you familiar with what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, I am. We have a white level, right? right? What's a white level? A white level is where you're relaxed and you're not 100% focused on your surroundings. What's a yellow? A yellow is a slightly heightened sense of awareness where you're aware of your surroundings. Um, you're mentally prepared to respond to something, but you're still just more of aware of what's going on. This is so that you can recognize things or be predicting Correct. around you. What's a red level? A red level is there's an imminent threat and you're recognizing the threat and beginning to respond to that. Um, so is this the kind of training that you were, or is this the kind of skill set you have that you were thinking about on the day of April 11, 2007, when the defendant's going around agitated and yelling and all this stuff? Yes. What level were you at? I would say I would fluctuate between a yellow and red. So you're watching things close to make sure nothing happened? Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any additional questions? Um, you did roll Michelle McNeil over, correct? I did not roll Michelle McNeil over. I removed her from the bedroom into the bathroom the entire time she was on her back. We tipped her head to the side so that the fluid could come out of her mouth. Okay, so she was never tipped up on her side? Uh, to my recollection, no. Okay, I just needed to clarify that. Thank you. Do you have questions for this witness? You'll pass them to the end of the row, please.
you approach, please? Just a few questions from the jury. You said that when you entered the bathroom that you recognized Mr. McNeil, but later you said that you'd never met him. Can you help explain that? Yes. Uh, what I meant by recognizing Mr. McNeil in the bathroom is that I recognized him here today as being the same person that was in the bathroom. Thank you. When you arrived, was there mucus on... Michelle McNeil's face area? To my best recollection, I don't recall if there was or was not. Was Michelle wearing both the black shirt and the white T-shirt when you arrived? Yes. Um, like I stated, she had a, a bra, some type of white shirt on, and a, a black garment, speaking generally, over the top of them. Where were they positioned on her body? Um, the... Black garment was mainly just on her shoulders and I want to say on her arms. The white garment was on her torso and then she had the bra on. I don't remember if the bra was over top of the white garment or vice versa. When fluid came out of Michelle's body the second time, how much would you say came out? Uh, it wasn't as much as the first time, but it was a little bit harder to estimate how much came out as her head was tipped to the side. Um, so not as much as the first time, less than three cups. Do you have follow-up questions? Go ahead. You may. I'm showing you what's been marked as States Exhibit 23. Yes, sir. How does that compare to States Exhibit 22? It appears to be identical. Okay. I'm going to have you make a few markings on this one, okay? Okay. If you would. I mean, counsel wants to approach. Sure. Um, Did 
you put on this diagram where Michelle's body was when you first came in and put her head with a circle and kind of like a stick figure or something? Her head was towards the entrance of the bathroom, and her feet were back that way, which would have been in that position. Okay. And then when you show with the same kind of uh, stick figure drawing here, where she, where you moved her to, it would have been in about. there. And is that how you remember it? or you? That's how I remember it to my best of my recollection. Okay. And when she expelled fluid, you didn't roll her whole body, you rolled no, her head? No, rolled her head. Which way did you roll that? Uh, it was towards me, it would have been towards the left side. Towards her, her, sorry, her right side. Her right side. Her right side, And yes. so you were on her right side. I was on her right side. Where you were? Uh, I put was it with an O. With an O. Which we put O-R, so we have a distinguishing. That's Officer Ormond right here. Correct. And you said you were doing chest compression. That's correct. And her head rolled towards you. Correct. Um, and where did the liquid spill? Uh, it was onto my left leg. And where was Officer Monsignor? Uh, he was towards the he her head. Um, so he's got his hands kind of on her head. He's got her hands on her head, yeah. With the uh, Ambu bag, you take one hand, either left or right, and I can't remember which one he used. Uh, one hand will hold the mask actually over the nose and mouth. The other hand will hold the the bag and do rescue breaths with that. Okay. And you said um, it spilled onto Officer Motzinger. Did it also spill onto the floor by her head? Uh, would have, yes, the first time, yes. Would you just kind of scribble where that is on the floor? <coughs> on the floor. So it would have roughly been here when we, uh, the first exploration would have been around her head, and then the second one would have been more towards me there. Okay. Move to offer Exhibit 23, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. 23 is received. <coughs> Can I publish this to the jury? You may. Those are all the questions I have. Really. Do you have redirect uh, or recross, oh, excuse yes, me? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned again that um, you just tipped her head to the side. Correct. And, and you said that she wasn't rolled up onto her side, correct? To my best recollection, no. Okay, and you testified at a preliminary hearing in this matter? I did. Uh, about a year ago? About. And may I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm looking at page 437 of the preliminary hearing transcript. Could you read for the jury what your answer was to this in terms of I asked you about how much water came out. Could you read just that paragraph down there? You bet. Just an ending just here, or, or would you like me to stop? Because the paragraph does go to the next page. Do you have a line number? Uh, yes, line number 23. Thank you. Um, can you just read from line 23 right there? Maybe three or four cups worth of water we realized that there was more going to come out, so we rolled her to her side to try to get that out of her lungs. Okay, so you didn't just tip her head, you rolled her to her side. Uh, apparently. Okay. I have nothing further. I do have one more question. Okay. Um, you didn't notice any rigor on Michelle's body? No, I never noticed any rigor. Okay, can you tell the jury what rigor is? Uh, rigor is when a person begins to stiffen up um, from being deceased. Thank you, officer. You're welcome. One question. If you did roll her onto her side, did you look for lividity? Not to my recollection, no. Thanks. Okay. Uh, will he remain under subpoena then? So. He'll remain under your subpoena. Uh, if you're needed, we'll uh, contact you. Okay. Thank you. You may step down.
Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be in recess for the weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. The trial will commence again on Tuesday morning at 8.30. Again, please be prompt. Uh, if one of you is missing, we can't get started. And I want to assure you that we will do everything we can to start on time as well. Uh, remember my admonition to you, don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, including family members or friends who will uh, undoubtedly ask you what your trial is about. And you need to simply explain to those individuals that you're under court order not to discuss the subject of the trial with them. Uh, don't do any research on your own using a computer, electronic device, or otherwise. Don't form or express any opinion about the case until it's finally submitted to you. Um, did ever? I, wa I wanted to make sure you had a lanyard on. On did everybody get one and has them with you? Make sure you wear those uh, on Tuesday morning. And if you could just pass that up, John, could you collect that exhibit? Council, if you would meet with the clerk, make sure we have collected all exhibits that have been admitted into evidence. They'll be retained here in court. I'm not exactly sure. Do we lock this so they can, can they keep the things here or will this courtroom be used on Monday? Okay, the courtroom will be used on Monday, but if there is something you want to leave here, Callie can make arrangements for it. Court's in recess. Very good. Court's in recess. Thank you. Please be seated. May we approach? You may.